Good day, folks. Well, it's good to be here with you again. Last week we were uh, together, and this week uh, God has blessed us with another opportunity. I pray and hope that all is well with you and yours. And thank you for inviting me <clears throat> into your places. We continue today uh, in the sermon series, A Living, uh, <clears throat> a living Faith, A Living Hope, pardon me. Uh, part, I, I, here I am, messing it up already. Bear with me. A living hope. Today we begin uh, our first look at the second chapter of First Peter. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn to First Peter chapter 2. Now dictionary.com defines immature as, quote, emotionally undeveloped, juvenile, childish. And words like premature, childish, or even the word green can be synonym, synonyms for immature. Now you may have heard this before, that someone is wet behind the ears when it comes to their understanding of things. Maybe they are in a new occupation, new job, just beginning to learn the ropes, so to speak. So in this way, they are immature or wet behind the ears. Of course, this is no way a suggestion of one's intelligence or capabilities. We should not assume that. But considering maturity in respect to a Christian's spiritual life, your life, my life, if you are a believer, the Word of God has plenty to say about this important subject. Consider with me the Apostle Paul and his dealings with the church at Corinth. In the New Testament, we have two of his letters from the Apostle Paul addressed specifically to the Corinthian church. And we find in these letters that Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote that he was dealing with a church with serious problems. There was divisions and there was uh, factions, there were splits, there was sexual morality in the church and many other issues as well. And the Apostle Paul, when you look at those letters, dealt with one of the core issues in the church. Now, it wasn't an issue of salvation. Paul was writing his two letters to genuine believers. The real issue was one of spiritual maturity. Some of the believers in the Corinthian church had prioritized human wisdom over godly wisdom, human fleshly desires over holiness and maturity in the faith. This is a wisdom that they had received from God through Paul as revealed to them by the Holy Spirit when Paul initially planted this church in Corinth. Now Dan Dumas, who is, uh, wrote an article for Ligonier uh, Ministry, said this about mature, immaturity. He said, immaturity plagues us all. Of course, Dumas would agree with Paul and maybe you and me, uh, I, I imagine you and me as well, that believers are saved and forgiven by the blood of Christ. And of course, no one is perfect. However, for Dumas, in his article, the aim of a believer's sanctification is a life of increasing maturity. And I would agree with him, because this is the believer's calling according to the Word of God, that is to grow in the knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But Dumas goes on then in that article, that blog, to reveal his, stand, uh, his hand when he said this, quote, we find the contemporary church, speaking of the church today, not spotless and without blemish, but rather shallow, worldly, inept, and downright content in its maturity. And he goes on to say this. Sadly, there are some in the church who prefer childish faith over against childlike faith, end quote. Now, these are quite strong words from Dumas and quite strong judgment of the church today. And as you ponder uh, this, uh, let me bring this closer to home and ask, we need to ask ourselves these questions. Am I growing in my childlike faith, or do I prefer childish, childish faith? Am I mature or immature? Well, as you ponder these things, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, and we will be reading verse 1 to 11, just for the context. Um, chapter 2 of 1 Peter, verse 1. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by man, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up 
as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Verse 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. This includes verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask now that your Holy Spirit would fill us and illuminate this word, that it would mold us and shape us, become more and more like Christ in every way. And not only in our minds, but in our hearts, and not only in our minds and hearts, but in our outward actions toward each other and toward our neighbors as well. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we begin our study here in chapter 2, our approach will be the same as with chapter 1. We will take chapter 2 in smaller bites, and today our focus will be with verses 1 to 3. 1 through to 3. There is a practicality to this approach. When you think about the original letter that Peter would have written, would not have, have, would not have chapter and verse breaks. And after all, even today, on the rare occasion that, one, that someone would write a letter, it would be somewhat awkward and unconventional to include chapter and verse in their letter. When we read the text, we need to read it as it is, a letter. And uh, we get a better context for that if we just read it all in one as a letter and over and over again. So our approach is not only practical in that way, but it's also practical for another good reason. For example, we're looking at verse, uh, our text here, verse 1 to 3, begins with the conjunction, so. Some of your translations would have, therefore, both our conjunctions translated that way. This conjunction <clears throat> is pointing back to the author's previous train of thought and appeal. So we can ask this question: What was the Apostle Peter? Uh, what was the Apostle Peter's appeal in the letter leading up to our text? Well, the first clue we can use is right in verse one itself, in the context of verse one. Here, the Apostle Peter gives his audience a list of vices a list of immoral behaviors. You can see that for yourself in verse 1. And it would have been obvious to the elect exiles that he was writing to, and it should be obvious to a believer today, to you and me, that the behavior that's listed here in verse 1 of chapter 2 is contrary to what the Apostle Peter had said back in chapter 1 in verse 22 and 23. There Peter said, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. For after all, a Christian, as Peter put it so well, has been born, again, not with perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. That's chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. And friends, this new spiritual birth is only the beginning for a believer. It begins with sanctification, and then it continues with sanctification, which we can call progressive sanctification, living out your life as a believer, becoming and being shaped by the Holy Spirit to be holy more and more as life goes on. Apostle Paul reminded, we go back to him, remember we're talking about the Corinthian church, he reminded that the visive Corinthian church of the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. He said, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. That's chapter 1 of Corinthians, I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. Well, this brings us right back here to chapter 1 of Peter's letter, where he had exhorted, if you remember, 
the elect exiles, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. There, Peter, quoting from Leviticus, the law. The apostle had made his appeal, my friends. Born again, Holy Spirit-filled believers who fear and love God in their obedience to Christ and his commands will demonstrate a lifestyle of holiness. A lifestyle that will manifest genuine love for all believers and genuine love to all people, regardless of race and creed. Well, this brings us right here to chapter 2, verse 1. Let's read that verse together. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Please notice with me the phrase, put away. It's part of that complete phrase, so put away. So put away here, and according to the ESV, is, is translated put away. Others might have put aside or, uh, or to lay aside. Uh, means to take off, to lay aside, to lay down. The sense here is to stop oneself, to stop oneself. And we see that this Greek verb is used elsewhere in the New Testament to describe some other things too. Uh, describe someone as removing their cloak, their garments, to put off their cloak, to put off their garments. It's also used as a metaphor here in verse 1 to describe a change of course. The believer's change of course. The Apostle Paul, we go back to him in his letter to the Ephesian church, described this change of course in this way. Paul had said, put off your old self. That's put off, put aside. Lay aside your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And to put on, put on the new self created in the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Ephesians 4, chapter 22, uh, Ephesians 4, verse 22 to 24. Paul then, in that very same chapter, goes on to describe the conduct of the new self, of the believer. Don't sin in your anger. Do honest work. Stop stealing. Watch your mouth. Rid yourself of this, what Paul would say, corrupt talk. Rid yourself of bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander and malice. A similar kind of list of vices that we have here in 1 Peter. Be kind to one another. Forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. And you'll find all this, all these comments and all these, these uh, exhortations from Paul in chapter 4, verse 25 to 32. You can check that out for yourself. Well, back to verse 1. It's important to note here this ver verb, put away. And just to give you a little, uh, little bit of a background on this, this verb in the original language is in the aorist tense. The action here then can be described or paraphrased in this way, and I got this from a commentary, so to borrow this paraphrase from a commentary goes like this. You could say, now that you have rid yourselves, now that you have rid yourselves, <laughs> rid yourself of all malice, etc. You see, the elect exile, exiles, his audience, by that sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, were no longer walking in there as Peter put it, futile ways inherited from your forefathers. Well, let, let yourself ponder on this. And let me ask you this question. This is a, quite a pointed question, quite a strong question, and, but it's a necessary question. Do you own your sin? I can ask myself that question. Do I own my sin? Or do you rationalize and make excuses to downplay sin? You know, it's just a white lie. As if a white lie is somehow different than a lie. A lie is a lie is a lie. Someone said, quote, we're spiritual Houdinis, contorting and twisting our way out of true repentance. The Puritan Richard Sibbs, in his book, The Bruise Read, and I would recommend that book, I have one in my library, a copy in my library, said this, quote, it is a very hard thing to bring a dull and evasive heart to cry with feeling for mercy. Our hearts, like criminals, until they are beaten from all evasions, never cry for the mercy of the judge. End quote. Now remember, this is a quote from an a, a individual living in the 1500s, a different judicial system than now. But the point is made that sin 
needs to be literally removed from us. And we, can, we need to mortify our bodies, our flesh, in order to do that. We go to God, speaking through his prophet Jeremiah, who said this, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Then God answered his own question in the very same following verse. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to the fruit of his deeds. It's the Lord who tests our hearts and our minds. That's in Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10. So do you own your sin? Let's expand the question a bit. Does a church own its sin? This is a serious question. It needs a serious answer. Because, friends, our sin, your sin, my sin, always impacts others. Always, always. Sin is not done in a vacuum. It impacts families, friends, congregations, neighborhoods, culture, the world. It's a very serious issue. Well, maybe you're hoping that this pastor will move on into verse 2. Sorry, folks, we're not done with verse 1. We go on. Peter said here, put away all malice. James, in his letter, said, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. James 4, 11. Friends, malice is the perversion of virtue for evil intentions. It is a perversion of virtue, something good for evil intentions. For example, we have the account of Cain in Genesis 4. Cain's offering to God. We know that story. I hope you do. You haven't read Genesis 4. Uh, Cain offered to God a sacrifice, was rejected, but his brother Abel's was accepted. Cain became angry, and then God reminded him, reminded Cain that in his anger, sin was crouching nearby. Something like that, it says in the text. Sin was nearby, ready to pounce. That Cain was to rule over it. That's Genesis 4, 7. Sadly, malice, hatred, had found a home in Cain's heart and he killed his brother Abel. Next, put aside all deceit. Later on in chapter 2, the Apostle Peter, speaking of Jesus, said, He, that is Jesus, committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. John, in his revelation, said of Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, would one day finally be defeated. Revelation 12, 9. So deceit, craftiness, treachery, and cunning. Put it aside. Put it off. Next, put aside hypocrisy. Folks, stop pretending. Let's stop pretending. Let's stop playing acting. Stop all pretense and outward show. The outward is a reflection of the inward. May they both be holy and mature. Next, put aside envy. We see envy is made manifest or revealed in our spite and resentment toward others. Do you resent someone? Do you, do you have spite against someone else? Maybe for their blessings. They're blessed, you think, beyond possibility. I don't know. Maybe their successes. You envy their successes or their possessions or something. You know, my friends, a lifestyle of love does not act out of spite out of envy. Love doesn't do that. Love always acts for the good and benefit of the other. Last but not least, put aside all slander. What is slander? Well, slander is abusive words falsely spoken that damage a person's reputation. Boy, we see this all over social media these days. All over. Friends, slander is evil speech, an evil report. So let's put this all together. So put away all malice, put off all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. So now we have finally arrived at verse 2, and you can take a little bit of a relaxation there. Let's read it together. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Hopefully you notice the metaphor here in verse 2. We have newborn infants and a spiritual milk. First, first, we we mustn't think the Apostle Peter was addressing new believers. Now, were there new believers in that first century church? Absolutely. But the context of the letter does not support this idea. Now, verse 2 might also be 
sound familiar to you because the Apostle Paul also used this metaphor in his first letter to the church in Corinth in the third chapter. But there, Paul was reprimanding, uh, reprimanding pardon me, the Corinthian church. Paul reminded them that when he founded the church, he had, what, fed them with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. Now, some time has gone by before Paul wrote this letter because he found out of the trouble that was there. And now time had gone by and the church has serious problems. Paul was not able to address them as he had wished. He said, I cannot address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. They were still... Uh, the term maybe we use today, baby Christians. They're, they're not new Christians. It's been some time, but they were still baby infants or infants in Christ. Instead of attaining maturity in the faith, these Corinthians had deviated. So in the Apostle Paul's estimation, although the Corinthian church had become very influential, they had, according to Paul, behaved only in human way. They were still not ready for what Paul called solid food. They had a childish faith, not a childlike faith. They were immature. Now, as we look at verse 2, the Apostle Peter was not reprimanding his audience. He was encouraging them to long for the pure spiritual milk, which I'll give you a clue, is the word of God. This phrase begins with the verb, look at the verb, long for. Some translations, maybe yours, uses the word desire. Desire the pure spiritual milk. Either way, this is to long for greatly. The psalmist said this, As a deer pants for flowing flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. That's Psalm 42, verse 1. The psalmist there describing a deep, abiding longing for God, for relationship, for companionship. Peter exhorting the elect exiles here is... Is, that, is exhorting them to long greatly for the pure spiritual milk. Why? That by it you may grow up into salvation. And we look at another verb here, grow up, meaning to grow or increase naturally or spiritually. In other words, to become spiritually mature in Christ. Fell, someone but uh, Adriel Sanchez in a blog posted three biblical signs of spiritual maturity. And Sanchez, Sanchez, uh, Sanchez, in his blog, paints a sad picture of spiritual immaturity. He put it this way, quote, Picture a grown man who should be teaching others, drinking out of a sippy cup and re-enrolling in preschool. That's pretty alarming. Here's how the writer of the letter of the Hebrews put it to his audience. The writer said, You have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you, again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Hebrews chapter 5. 11 to chapter 6, verse 1. And as for Sanchez's biblical signs of maturity, let me share those in no order of importance, and it goes like this. One, spiritually immature Christians are controlled by their fleshly desires. Say that again. Spiritually immature Christians are controlled by their fleshly desires. Two, spiritually immature Christians aren't able to play nice with other Believers. That was happening in the Corinthian church. There was discord and division. And three, spiritually immature Christians are gullible to strange doctrines. And my goodness, this is one of the biggest issues I see in the church today. Immature Christians being, uh, uh, being taught strange doctrines, false teaching, and error. And they're gullible enough to swallow it because they just do not know their Bibles. They do not have a mature faith. You know, folks, when we think of our own spiritual growth, we know that maturity happens slowly over time. We've all experienced that, I hope, and know that. Hebrews reminds us that the mature believer are those that have the power of discernment, but trained by consistent practice. Sometimes we fail. We have to get up. We learn. 
Friends, this is a lifelong endeavor. We are, at, the Holy Spirit is in process of sanctifying you and me day by day, moment by moment, circumstance by circumstance, issue by issue. Every time we read our Bible, every time we pray, every time we go to church, every time we fellowship, every time we serve with and use our spiritual gifts, every time we face circumstances, difficult ones, every time we come against persecution, every, everything, our workspaces, our family places, all those things, the Holy Spirit uses to grow us into maturity, to give us discernment and, and understand what is evil and what is good and what is holy and what is right. Apostle Peter and Paul in the letter to the Hebrews highlight the importance of spiritual maturity and exhort believers to live a lifelong pursuit of maturity in Christ. You know, when we consider the 21st century church, I'm thinking particularly of the Western church, the American research group Barna came to the conclusion in 2009 with their survey and put it this way, quote, that almost nine out of ten senior pastors of Protestant churches asserted that spiritual maturity is one of the most serious problems facing the church, end quote. And to make matters worse, Barna revealed that pastors had no, quote, strategy for facilitating such maturity. This resulting in, quote, church-going adults who are Uncertain as to what their church would define as healthy, spiritual, mature, a spiritual mature of Christ, in Christ. So the question we are challenged with this morning, take on a elevated importance. They should anyways. Am I growing in my childlike faith or do I prefer childish faith? Am I mature or immature in my faith? Well, friends, having that all said, having said all that, we are left with the Apostle Peter's statement as we begin to wrap things up. Peter said, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. My friends, believers who have experienced the Lord's goodness, his graciousness, have a really wonderful, blessed reason and a responsibility to receive the imperishable seed that Peter's mentioned in the text. What might that seed be? Well, Peter said it in chapter 1, the living and enduring word of God. The good news that was preached to you, the gospel, that's verse 23 and 25. We need to be in the word, and we need to be studying, and we need to be praying, and we need to be fellowshipping in person. There's no such thing as church online. It really isn't. That's not what the Bible teaches. But friends, you might disagree with me, but read your Bible and you'll find out what church is. If you want to grow into spiritual maturity, long for the pure spiritual milk of the word of God so that you may grow up, mature into salvation. And finally, my friends, when you think of a lifestyle of love for God and others, it will not act out in spite. It will not practice deceit. It will, desire, it will not desire to be better than others. It will not destroy a person's reputation. This describes childish faith. A mature faith acts for the good of others, is honest, transparent, and does not lie, rejoices in the success of other people, and is happy to give praise and affirmation. I pray that we would be a people of childlike faith. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you. And we just leave that. May it uh, percolate in our hearts and minds. And then may it make its way to our fingers and our hands and our feet and our legs and into action. I pray for each person listening to this. I pray, God, that you would bless them. I pray, God, that you would help them in their need and help them to grow into maturity, to have childlike faith, faith, not childish faith. We pray all this for your glory, Lord, and for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, folks. God bless. Shalom.